We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Great to see you all. We're uh, in a really great spot in that we're starting off a brand new series this morning, and I'm glad that you're here for the kickoff of it. For the next six weeks, we're going to be going through the book of Daniel together, and it's a series called Daniel, uh, How to Thrive in Babylon. And that might be kind of a confusing title to some of you because you don't live in Babylon, uh, but at the end of the day, what we're going to see is that this study has a, tr- a tremendous overlap in each of our lives. There's an incredible way that the story of Daniel and what we can learn from it is going to affect each of us in the way that we go about and live our lives today. Now, oftentimes when we look at the, the stories of Daniel or we read the book of Daniel, what we think of Daniel is that it's a kind of an adventure, a uh, collection of adventure stories for children. Right? You think of things like Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They get thrown into the fiery furnace and uh, the writing on the wall, you know, the hand with, and, and there's some really cool stories in here. But at the end of the day, what we all need to understand is that Daniel is not an adventure story for children. It is an instruction manual for all of us on how to thrive in a culture that is opposed to our values and traditions as people of faith. See, Daniel was, was in a situation where from the point where he was about 15 years old, for the first 15 years of his life, he lived in a culture that made sense to him. He lived in a culture that valued the same things he valued, that saw truth the same way he saw truth. But at about 15 years old, all the way until he died when he was 90 years old, his culture was incredibly shifted in that he was pulled out of his culture and placed in a Babylonian culture. And now he was trying to figure out how does he thrive? How does he live in such a way where the things that he values and the truth that he knows and the God that he serves, none of those things are compromised as he's now living in a culture that is opposed to all of those things. So if you think about that, it's, it's a really powerful understanding. The series we're going to go through is going to walk us through how we can thrive in our Babylon of today. How do we thrive in a culture that's different, that values different things and sees truth differently and all those things? So the reason we're going through this series, if, if someone were to say, why are we studying the book of Daniel? There's three things I want you to know. One is that this is really us. When you look at this story about living in a culture that opposes your values and traditions, if you're a follower of Christ in the room right now, this is something that's gonna really click and resonate with all of us. This is us, all right? That's the first reason we're gonna go through this study. Another thing is that Daniel is rich in in prophecy. Uh, If you look at the book of Daniel, about the first half of Daniel are some really cool stories where you find some of those uh, the, those children's stories, right? Maybe that you, you heard about in Sunday school. That's the first half of stories about Daniel and his friends. The second half of the book of Daniel is a prophetic book where Daniel talks about things that are going to happen in the future. Some of those things have already happened, and some of those things are going to happen and haven't, still haven't happened yet. And we're going to be able to look at that together as a church. Another thing that I'm really excited about, another reason why we're going to look at Daniel, is it shows us simply the truth that that Daniel's God is our God, that God doesn't change. In fact, I want you to think about it this way. Culture changes, God doesn't. Everyone say that with me, all right? Culture changes, God doesn't. The exact same God that Daniel worshiped, that Daniel loved, that Daniel wanted to make sure to continue to remain faithful in service to that God, that's the same God, the same sovereign God that we worship today. And as culture changes from generation to generation, 
God does not change. So we get to explore about how to live in a culture that's different and opposed, right? We get to explore that because that's kind of the situation we're in. And how do we continue to love and serve a God that never changes? We're going to explore that in this series. You see, one of the things I want you to understand is that God has always been sovereign, which means God has always been all-knowing and his hand is all over everything. And one of the songs we sang this morning was, uh, God, he's over every victory. Remember that? God, you're over every victory, right? We, we recognize that God is over every victory. Well, oftentimes when we sing that, by the way, we're singing about a God who's over the victories that work out in our benefit. But do you know God is even a God over victories that don't work out in our benefit? In fact, look at this, and if you open up your copy of God's Word to Daniel chapter 1, we're going to go through the whole first chapter this morning, Uh, open up your copy of God's Word. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, just reach underneath the chair in front of you, write your name in that Bible, and take it home with you. We want you to have a Bible, right? So every person in this room owns a Bible at this moment. Open up your copy of God's Word to Daniel chapter 1, and let me show you about how God is sovereign over every victory, All right, check this out. Daniel chapter one, first two verses. It says, during the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Here's what this is saying is King Jehoiakim, he's a king over, over the Hebrew people, over Daniel's, over God's people, right? He's, he's a king over a, a culture that's a lot more in line with Daniel's way of doing things. That's where Daniel lives and thrives, right? That's where he's doing things. But then this other king, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, it says he comes over to Jerusalem and takes it over. And that doesn't sound good, right? The bad guy comes over into the good guy and takes it over, right? And that doesn't sound like something that God would, would want. But then if you keep reading, in fact, read the next five verses or five words with me. You ready? It says, the Lord, say it out loud, nice and loud, the Lord gave him victory. The God over every victory gave the bad guy victory. God said You know, to Nebuchadnezzar, listen, nobody takes over anything without my knowing about it. I'm going to give you victory over Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in. Our sovereign God allows it to happen. It says, the Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Let me just be really clear about this. You can't do anything if God doesn't want it to happen. If God isn't going to allow it to happen, you can try as hard as you want, but if God says it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. And the fact that this happened means that God allowed it and permitted it to happen. Okay? So here we are, and now Daniel, he's about 15 years old. In fact, give you a little bit of a context, this, this story, the life of Daniel happens about halfway between the life of David and the life of Jesus. So about 400 years after King David, you see Daniel, and about another 600 years after Daniel, Jesus enters the picture in the New Testament. So that's a little bit of a placement of where all this fits in. Another thing to know about the book of Daniel is Daniel is considered, uh, the the book of Daniel is considered a major prophet. Daniel is considered a major prophet. And and it's important to understand that when you look and read God's word, it hasn't been put together in chronological order. All right? It's, in fact, there's going to be times where you're reading about someone and then they die and then you're over like three pages and you're reading about that person again. Well, it's because God's word wasn't put together chronologically the way most books maybe are written, but instead it's put together in categorical order. So there's different categories of scripture that have been put together and, and Daniel fits into a category called the major prophets. There's another section called the minor prophets. It's not because they were less cool or, or didn't do as much. It's just because their books are smaller, right? The major prophets, they're just bigger books of prophecy, and that's what Daniel is. Daniel is a major prophet, and he's about 15 years old when King Nebuchadnezzar comes into Jerusalem, takes it over, 
and is about to grab some young men out of this culture and pull them into a new culture and try to get them to shift and change into the new culture. Daniel is about 15 years old when all this happens, all right? So let's explore with that context some things that we can learn uh, about the culture and how it shifts. The first thing I want everyone in here to know, and if you take notes, if you're filling in the blanks this morning on that, that note sheet, this is your first one, is that when culture shifts, it can happen quickly. When culture shifts, it, it usually actually happens very quickly. For Daniel, right, he, he goes to bed one night, and he's a 15-year-old living in his culture, his way of life, and then he wakes up the next day, and there's a new king on the throne. There's a new king who's, who's besieged his town and is grabbing people and moving them against their will into a new culture. Culture shift can happen so quick. You think about it. Just one executive order from the White House right? Culture can shift just like that. One decision from the Supreme Court, right? Boom, like just like that, culture can shift. There can be one natural disaster, one, uh, one uh, terrorist attack, one, all sorts of things that can happen, and overnight, culture just shifts on a whim. Think about just a one, you know, influencer on TikTok wears a new pair of shoes, and boom, that's the pair of shoes that everybody wants, you know, T. Swift, is that her name? Taylor's, you know, whatever. Comes out with a new song, and then boom! Like, that's the, everyone's singing it. Our culture can shift so quickly. But here's one thing to understand. Culture usually shifts really quickly, but you don't recognize that it shifted quickly because Satan is too smart for that, right? That whole frog in the pot of boiling water. Uh, what Satan wants to do is as culture has shifted quickly, Satan wants to make sure you don't notice it. So he kind of allows culture to seem like it's shifting slowly over time so that we all adjust to it. And that's what's about to happen to Daniel. Daniel's sh- culture has shifted overnight. But he's now going to be walked through this three-year assimilation process where he really kind of has this long three-year period to kind of not notice so quickly that his culture is shifting around him. And that's something that you're going to notice too. All right, here's the second thing. When culture shifts, it tries to reshape you. When the culture shifts around you, what it wants to do is mold you and kind of refi- uh, reshape you so that you fit into the, the, the way that you're now supposed to look in the culture around you, the way the culture thinks you should look around you. So what we see here is how this works out in Daniel is this process that I would call operation assimilation, right? It's King Nebuchadnezzar. He wants to grab these, these people that he's just taken over, and he wants to assimilate them into this new way of doing things. So you look at verse 3. It says this, the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who've been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only the strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. And then he says this. Don't miss this this last sentence. He says, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Here's what he's done, essentially. He's created a three-year college program, and he's given these new people that have been taken by force out of their culture and into a new culture, and he's given them a full tuition scholarship to Babylonia State University. That's what he's done. He's grabbed them out of their system, their way of doing things, their value system, their, their faith, you know, surrounded by people that share their faith. Grab them out of it, and he's saying, listen, I want you to take these young men, I want you to put them into this training program that's gonna last for three years, and I wanna make sure that by the time they're done, they're well-versed in all of our way of doing things all of our literature and all of our knowledge. I want them to have a new way of thinking. Think about this for a moment. If you remember last year, we did a study here at ACC on worldviews. 
And a worldview is simply the way that you view the world. And your worldview shapes all of your decisions. It shapes the way you think and the way you speak and the way you act. Your worldview is going to change a lot. Well, essentially what King Nebuchadnezzar is doing here is he's saying, listen, I need to pull these guys out. They have a certain worldview. They have a certain way they view the world. But for the next three years, we need to pour into them a new way of viewing the world. We need to change the way they view the world. We need them to adjust and reshape into our culture. Because what happens if you can get people to adopt a new worldview, then you can change the way they think. And if you can change the way they think, then you can change the way they behave. And what he's essentially doing is saying, listen, they have this God that they worship. They have a way of doing things. They have this moral system and these ethics. None of that's going to work around here. Not in this new culture. So we're going to grab them into this new culture. And we're going to take three years and give them this full tuition scholarship. And and think about it back then. Uh, they didn't have, right, uh, Google and, and Spotify and YouTube and social media and all the TV that we have and all that stuff, right? I think what would have happened nowadays if we were to, uh, if the culture is trying to uh, reshape you, what it's going to do is it's going to give you a three-year program of having you consume all that this culture has to offer. It's going to make sure you have all the social media accounts and that you watch all the content that's coming through the news. It's going to make sure you watch all the shows and you're hearing all the language and you're paying attention to the culture and what's, what's flying and what's not flying in this culture, and it's essentially a three-year indoctrination program to try to get Daniel and his friends to adjust to this new culture. That's what's happening here. But think about this for a moment. What's even better than a full tuition scholarship? Anybody know? It's a full ride scholarship. Full ride. I mean, now you're getting tuition, and you're getting room and board right? You're getting your books paid for and your fees paid for. A full ride. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? And that's essentially saying, listen, I'm going to give these guys even better than a full tuition scholarship. If you keep reading in verse 5, it says, the king assigned them with a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. He's given them the best he's got. The king's saying, listen, I want these guys to be so assimilated in this culture. I'm willing to give them all that our culture, the best our culture has to offer. And he's feeding them from his own kitchens. It says they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. You think about this. What is the the best way to a man's heart? It's through his stomach, right? The king knows, listen, if we're going to win these guys over, we got to be strategic, we got to essentially take some of the, the, the things that are most appealing about our culture, the things that, that, that probably would entice someone who has a different way of thinking and a way of whatever. we got to take the things that look really uh, delightful and delicious and, and look like they're going to bring a lot of happiness and joy, and let's take all those things and offer them to the people until they become so uh, ingrained with our way of doing things. We've, we've taken all of our culture and just crammed it down their throat until they become like us. That's the way the culture works. As the culture shifts, it wants to reshape you into the mold of the culture around you. It wants you to behave and think and act and speak and all those things just like the culture around you. It wants to reshape you. Here's the third thing. When culture shifts, it preys on the young. Parents, I really want to make sure you write this one down. When culture shifts, it preys on the young. You've all heard the the phrase before, right? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. There's a point at which we're, we're kind of at a point where we're old enough, we've got our, our traditions, our culture, we know how we like to do things, and as the culture starts shape, uh, reshaping around us and changing around us, and there's a new style of music and a new way to dress and a new all that, we're just like, eh, I don't want any of that anymore, right? There gets a point where we're not as susceptible to the culture changing around us because we're stuck in our ways. So what happens is our culture recognizes that if you really want to shape someone, if you really want to have an opportunity to mold someone and reshape them, the best opportunity is to do it while the clay is still wet and moldable. A shifting culture will prey on your children. It will 
You think about clay, right? When you're trying to create a vase and that thing's spinning and it's wet, what you're doing is you're trying to make an impression, right? You're pushing in certain places and pulling on certain things and you're trying to create this new shape. And the culture recognizes that it can't do that if the clay is hard, but it can do it when it's soft. I wrote down a couple things I want to share with you about this thought. Here's, here's the first thing. And this is for parents. You listen. It says, it is important that you are paying attention to who is making an impression on your children. It is important that you are paying attention to who is pushing their thumb and changing the shape of the vase that is going to be the final shape of your kids. It is important that you pay attention to who you give access to put an impression on your kids. Because the culture, listen, our culture salivates for the attention and the affection of your children. Our culture salivates for the attention and the affection of your children. It knows how moldable they are and wants to get their hands all over them to be able to reshape them into the culture that they live in. And that's why it's so important and so valuable that you as a parent recognize that and do whatever you can to to protect the wrong people for making an impression on your children. Here's number four. Number four is that when culture shifts, it tries to give you a new identity. Now, this is something I had missed every time I would read Daniel chapter one. I didn't really pay attention to this. What these verses were about to read, but where you're going to see is that the culture, when it shifts around you, what it wants to do, what it's going to try to do is peel off your old name tag and slap a new one on you. It's going to try to give you a new name. And that's exactly what they do to Daniel and his friends. Verses six through seven. It says, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen. So remember, this is, these are uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has gone into Jerusalem and taken it over, and then he's told his chief of staff to go find the young guys that are moldable and, and grab them and bring them into Babylon, and we're going to reshape them, and we're going to remold them. And four of the guys that he chose are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And it says that they're all from the tribe of Judah. And then it says it's the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. Now, when you just first read this, it seems kind of harmless. In fact, sometimes we... We do change our name when we adjust from one culture to another. There, you know, maybe you've, you've migrated from another culture into uh, this culture, and you just say, hey, you know, it'd probably be easier to take on a, a more American-sounding name. Maybe, maybe some of you have experienced that. I know uh, if you look at uh, your family history, wherever those of us who are immigrants from other places, you look at how your name or last name has changed over time. It's just it made more sense. Well, when you shift into a new culture, a new culture wants to give you a new name. But what we don't recognize is that this isn't a harmless thing most of the time. What's happening here when these guys are given a new name is that the culture that has shifted around them is trying to take away their identity and who God says that they are and trying now to say, let us tell you who the culture says that you are. Look at these names. How about Daniel? Daniel's name, his Hebrew name, means God is my judge. You see, his parents gave him this name that has meaning and identity and purpose, and it's recognizing that Daniel has one God and that that God is in control, and he calls all the shots. His name means God is my judge, and then he's renamed Balthasar, which means lady, protect the king. I want to be really clear here that one of the things that happens when cultures shift when you go into a culture that is opposed to the value system of this book right here, 
Its primary objective is to cause confusion and, and, and not just confusion, but even celebrate the idea of your identity being all confused and jumbled up and messed up. With, whether that's gender identity, whether that's your sexual identity, whether that's the identity in who you are as a follower of Christ, where it's just to confuse all of those things. The evil one wants to, to get in and, and, and put a new label on you. And try to take things that are clearly understood, that are known to be true. Because listen, if Satan can make you question even simple, basic things like what gender you are, then he can make you question everything. He can make you question your relationship to God. He can make you question your relationship to your parents. He can make you question all sorts of more compl complicated things because he was able to complicate even the most basics of things. You see, Satan knows that if he can get you to question the most basic elements of your identity, he can get you to question everything. How about Hananiah? Hananiah's Hebrew name meant Yahweh has been so gracious. Think about the beauty of this name. It's a recognition that God is good. Because what is grace? Grace is simply, right, when we receive things that we don't deserve, when God gives us things that we don't deserve, we recognize that that's grace, that God's given us just unmerited favor. And, and Hananiah's name means that God shows me unmerited favor. And then his name is changed to Shadrach, which means I am scared of God. I am fearful of God. You have to understand that this isn't kind of like the, the appropriate fear of God. All of us should fear God. That's not what this name has been changed to. His name has been changed to you know that God that you thought was gracious, that would do good things and give you all that you need that you don't deserve? Yeah, no, no, no. You should be scared of that God. Take that old label off and slap that new label on. And here we have Hananiah is now Shadrach. How about this one? Mishael's name meant who is what God is? Who's bigger and better than my God? And his name is changed to this. I am despised and humiliated. Can you imagine stepping into a new family? Maybe it's been adopted and they're like, hey, you don't want to give you a new name. Despised and humiliated sounds good. I mean, how messed up is that? I mean, think about the, the difference, too, in this identity. Uh, what, what God, what Mishael's name uh, meant was, listen, it's, it's okay to understand who you are in comparison to who God is. God, there's no one like God. I can, I can never be like God. It, we're, we're okay looking at ourselves in comparison to how great God is. That's a great way to view yourself. But what the culture wants you to do is instead to view yourself in comparison to the culture around you. And oftentimes when we compare ourselves to others around us, we walk away with this label right here. I'm nothing. How about Azariah? His name meant Yahweh has helped. But Abednego's name means servant of the god Nabu. Here's the point. Because I'm going to run out of time this morning. Culture wants you to question everything about who God says that you are. The culture wants you to question your sexual identity. It wants you to question your, your understanding of your relationship to God. It wants you to question your purpose and actually convince you that there is none, that you weren't, don't have really much of a purpose, that you're just gonna die one day and go to dirt. The culture wants you to, to start even questioning your confidence, the things that you used to be confident about and the way you used to stand up boldly. The culture wants to tear all that down. See, when I was born, my parents got to give me a name. They named me Matthew Scott Osdall. Matthew had significant meaning for them. They, they chose that name and they thought about that name and they prayed about that name. The word Scott, my middle name, right? I was named after my father. Again, that was chosen with intentionality. My last name, it points to my Scandinavian, Norwegian background, right? My name has meaning and my parents chose it. Why do they get to choose my name? Why does the law say they get to pick my name? Because they made me. They're the ones who made me and they're the ones who get to name me. 
But think about this for a moment, even bigger than my parents. Like who made my parents? Who made, like at the end of the day, we know that God is the creator of all things and therefore he's the one who gets to decide what your identity is. He gets to decide who you are. The culture hates that and wants to try to peel off those labels and put new ones on you. When culture shifts, it will try to give you a new identity. So here we are at that moment where we ask the question, God, what do you want us to do with this? What now, God? And I want to ask you to consider doing four things in light of recognizing that we all live in a culture that is opposed to our values and our our understanding of truth and our faith system. What is it that we should do? What can we learn from Daniel chapter 1 about how Daniel thrived in his new culture? Here's the first thing. I want to encourage you to be resolute. Be resolute. Your version of the Bible might say, be resolved. Or it might say that Daniel made up his mind or that he was purposed. In Daniel 1.8, here's what it says. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself. As the culture has shifted and Daniel is put into a new culture and a new way of doing things, he's just gone through a three-year program trying to reprogram his worldview. It says, but throughout that whole process, Daniel was resolute. He was determined. No one is going to shift me away from what I know to be true and who I know to be true. He was resolute. And I want you to understand resolution isn't just something that happens in a moment. This resolution happened because for the first 15 years of his life, his parents poured into him and trained him up and raised him and taught him how to love God. These are things that happen over time. But Daniel, in that moment, he had to make a decision. He said, I am going to be resolved to do things God's way. You have to start up front with a firm decision, and that firm decision is this. I will stand firm in Christ no matter what. Here's the second thing that we all need to do. We need to show grace and truth in this culture. It's easy to go into a culture that's different than we are and say, you know what, I'm just going to go out there, I'm just going to yell truth at everybody. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But that's not what Daniel does. In fact, if you keep reading from about verse 8 through verse 16, Daniel goes into the situation and he shows tremendous balance between grace and truth, right? So the king is trying to tell these guys to eat certain foods and Daniel doesn't want to defile himself. He's been resolved that he's not going to defile himself. So he goes to the guy in charge of this program and he says, listen, would you just let us for 10 days, by the way, 10 in scripture is a number of testing. He says, let us test Put us to the test for 10 days. Let us eat what we think is good and right instead of what the king is telling us to eat and see if at the end of the 10 days we're not stronger and healthier and look like we have more color in our, you know, and all of let us Let us show you that our way is better. And the, the, the assistant says, all right, for 10 days. He agrees and sure enough, Daniel and his friends pass the test. But what you're seeing in this whole process is that they had to, Daniel and his friends, they had to balance grace and truth. Here's why, because truth without grace is mean. If you just go into the world and you just speak truth over and over again, but you don't show any grace, you're just gonna come across as really mean-spirited and have no effectiveness in the kingdom of God. But on the other side, grace without truth is meaningless. If you just allow people to speak unfalsities all all day long and you never go in and never speak any truth, it's pointless. So what we have to do is learn from Daniel that when you're in a culture that's different than yours, you gotta balance grace and truth. Listen, God calls us to be ambassadors for his kingdom in this world. But not just that, he calls us to be effective ambassadors for his kingdom in this world, which means we gotta balance grace and truth. We gotta carry both of those things at the same time. Here's number three. We need to learn the culture, but not embrace it. It's okay to to learn the culture. When there's a new style of music or a new 
thing or a new whatever. Like, it's okay to like try to figure out what the culture's doing around you so you can be an effective ambassador in it. Here's what it says about Daniel in verse 17. It says, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. In other words, he gave them an unusual aptitude for understanding the culture they were living in. But notice they don't embrace it. They don't choose to live in it. And here's number four. When you do those first three things, I love number four, is watch what God can do through you. What you're going to see is that Nebuchadnezzar and his people, the Babylonians, they had this hunger for truth. And when they saw something special in Daniel, and they saw something special in his friends, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when he sees something in them that's different, it's so attractive. In fact, let's read those last few verses together, verses 17 to 21. It says, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and visions of dreams. And when the training period ordained by the king was completed, the three-year process was over, right? The chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar, and the king talked with them, and no one was, and no one impressed him as much as who? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These four guys who stood resolute and said, we're not going to take on this culture around us. We're going to stand firm in who God says that we are. These four guys impressed the king more than all the rest of them. And then it says this, so they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them, listen to this, 10 times more capable of any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. Let me tell you why the king found Daniel and his friends more, 10 times more reliable than anyone else in this whole program. It's because they stood firm on the truth. They didn't compromise. They didn't give in and assimilate to the culture around them. They knew who God is. They know what truth is. They recognize that they're pointless and meaningless if they give up all the identity and take on the identity of the culture. And because of that, they were able to watch what God could do through them as we continue reading in the book of Daniel next week and beyond. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for being so good to us that you give us these examples in scripture where we get to see Daniel. We get to see uh, other young men who, who chose to be resolute in who you say that they are. They chose to specifically understand the culture around them, but not to embrace it. They chose to, to purposely stand firm in the truth and in doing so, God, they were able to make a difference for your kingdom. As they balanced grace and truth, they were able to make an impact on those that they were able to come in contact with. God, help us to be a church that does the same thing in our Babylon. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.